If preeclampsia presents early then, there's a risk of preterm delivery, which in turn can lead to significant perinatal morbidity and mortality related to prematurity. The newborn is at risk of needing admission to the special care baby unit or neonatal intensive care unit because of the various prematurity related complications, including respiratory distress syndrome, anemia, infection, etc. And there is also an increased risk of long term health problems such as obesity, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and chronic lung disease. For the woman with early onset preeclampsia, she's at risk of severe complications of preeclampsia, such as eclampsia and placental abruption. In relation to the mode of delivery, if cesarean section is needed, in the case of extreme preterm birth, there's a chance of classical cesarean section where a vertical incision is made to the uterus. Then this will impact on the mode of delivery for future pregnancies, as repeat cesarean section is needed. Even for lower segment cesarean section, for future pregnancies, there are risks such as scar dehiscence and placenta accreta spectrum disorder. And of course, for both types of cesarean section, there are the usual operative risks, such as injury to surrounding organs, including the bladder and bowel, and postpartum hemorrhage. Research for finding ways to prevent or treat preeclampsia continues. I'm aware that an important trial in South Africa has shown that in women with early onset preeclampsia, the use of metformin prolongs pregnancy and that the gestational age of delivery is higher in the metformin group in comparison to the placebo group. So I wonder if metformin acts in a similar way as aspirin. There's a big ongoing trial in Australia in evaluating the role of isomeprazole, a proton pump inhibitor, PPI, starting in early pregnancy in reducing the risk of preeclampsia in high-risk women as determined by the first trimester combined test with maternal factors, biophysical and biochemical markers. The theory behind the use of PPIs for preventing preeclampsia -pre is supported by clinical evidence that PPIs reduce secretion of SFLT1 which is an antigenic factor implicated in the development of preeclampsia from primary placental cells, placental tissue, and primary endothelial cells. Currently, Professor Nicolaides is embarking on a very exciting trial in the third trimester of pregnancy, whereby combined screening is conducted at 35 to 36 weeks. Then women will be randomized into being induced at various time points according to the risk. This trial will, of course, focus on whether such an approach to screening and intervention could reduce the rate of term preeclampsia, a topic that needs a lot of research right now, as term preeclampsia constitutes the majority of preeclampsia cases and that our first trimester screen and prevent program is not effective in reducing the risk of this complication. This is a very important but difficult issue to address. I think my answer is simple, but it will take some efforts to bring about change. We need to raise awareness that preeclampsia and other related complications are major causes of maternal and perinatal morbidity and mortality. Collectively, we need to start screening and preventing preeclampsia in early pregnancy. Sadly, in low resource settings, this would be perceived as very challenging, as pregnant women do not present for early antenatal care. We need to focus on how we can make early antenatal care more accessible to pregnant women in order to screen and prevent preeclampsia. For the mother, preeclampsia can lead to preterm birth placental abruption, multi-organ dysfunction affecting the liver, kidneys, blood, central nervous system. Bearing in mind, eclampsia and stroke are less common, but they are very severe complications. 
for the baby, there's an increased risk of growth restriction. And if there is preterm birth, then there come the complications related to prematurity, such as respiratory distress syndrome, anemia, infections, etc. The best way of managing these issues must be early screening and prevention. What is important is that even with aspirin prophylaxis, there is no 100% prevention, and therefore patient education is essential. We need to tell high-risk women that there is still a risk of developing preeclampsia despite aspirin prophylaxis. We need to emphasize the need of good drug compliance, which in turn increases the treatment effects of aspirin. And we need to educate them about what signs and symptoms they need to look out for in order to seek medical help timely. ISWOC's mission is to improve women's health through the provision, advancement, and dissemination of the highest quality education, standards, and research information around ultrasound in obstetrics and gynecology. We have thousands of members across the globe. We are very well placed for providing high-level education in the forms of webinars, in-person lectures, hands-on courses, and we have also issued a guideline about preeclampsia screening and prevention. We need to promote the use of ultrasound in reducing maternal and perinatal morbidity and mortality. Even a simple scan at 11 to 14 weeks for assessing the uterine artery Doppler flow can potentially save lives. From my perspective, I think the focus remains to be related to prediction and prevention of preeclampsia. Though our first trimester triple test with maternal factors, blood pressure, uterine artery Doppler, and serum placenta growth factor is effective in predicting early onset preeclampsia with preterm delivery, I would be very, I would be very happy to see other effective markers for the improved prediction of both preterm and term preeclampsia. And I'm aware that the search for these potential markers is ongoing. I will continue doing what I've been doing well. Indeed, I will continue my search for novel biomarkers, as well as developing personalized approaches in preventing this life-threatening condition. Music